Greetings, my fellow Americans, and welcome to another episode of the Great Montana Conspiracy Podcast. I'm your host, Ron Glick. Tonight, we're going to be talking about prosecutors, and prosecutors, of course, being the main aggressor of the overcriminalized so called justice system in the United States. But before we start talking about it, if you happen to be watching this on YouTube, please do me a favor and Let's go ahead and like and subscribe the video, share the video with anyone you can on any of your social media platforms. And of course that holds true for any platform in which you're watching this, just not all platforms are going to have the like, subscribe features. They may be named something else, but either way, show love, share the video most importantly. But let's also get the, the video shared on YouTube and get some viewing hours to log in for us, okay? It'd be awesome, thank you. As I mentioned, tonight we're going to be talking about prosecutors. Now, in the criminal justice system, no other individual holds as much power or control as prosecutors. You would think it would be the judges. It's not. The judges, if, without the prosecutor, it's, it, it falls apart. It kind of reminds me of a joke. When, I had, uh, when man was first created, all the body parts were trying to decide who would be boss. Well, the brain said, since I control all the body parts... I should be boss. The leg said, no, 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 I'd take you everywhere you need to go. Without me, you would, you would not be able to move around, do anything, get food, gather anything, therefore I should be boss. And of course, the arm said, no, without us, you wouldn't be able to lift anything to do anything to, do, to eat or, or anything else, so we should be boss. And the hands would say, well, no, because we're the ones who actually grab it, we're the ones actually doing the work, we're the ones with the food in the mouth, we should be boss. Of course, stomach says, oh, no, no, I digest all the food. Without me, you have nothing. I should be the boss of the body. Well, all the body parts kept arguing back and forth, and then the anus spoke up, and everybody laughed. <laughs> and, of course, the anus was very self-conscious, and so it closed up. Well, pretty soon, the brain became foggy, the legs became wobbly, the hands became shaky, the stomach became sick, and everyone realized they couldn't function without the anus. And so they, they all unanimously decided... To get the anus to open back up, the anus should be boss. Which just goes to prove you don't have to be a brain to be a boss, just an ass. And that applies to prosecutors. You don't have to be the brain of the institution. You don't have to be the, the one on the bench and the, and the robes and calling it all into order and appear to be in control of the process. <clears throat> That's actually the prosecutor. In Montana, they're called county attorneys. In other jurisdictions, they may be district attorneys or state attorneys, but the fact is they're all prosecutors. They decide what and who to prosecute in a court of law for the criminal side of the U.S. court system. Now, more importantly, they decide what and who not to prosecute. In a corrupt good old boy system like Montana, they never prosecute the officials. Officers, deputies, judges, elected officials, appointed officials, elite members of society, like business owners. We talked a couple months ago about Hank's Hatchet's axe throwing. For those who weren't watching the videos at the time, I live in downtown Kalispell. I live above a bookstore <clears throat> um, called Blacktail Mountain Books. If you're ever make it to Kalispell, you gotta check it out, it's a great bookstore. Next door, there used to be a glass store, uh, Luma Glass. And the other side of that was a tenant residency called the Rosebrier, now called My House. The glass place was sa is literally sandwiched between the two other buildings. There's no space. There's literally brick wall to brick wall to brick wall. <clears throat> well, a, an axe throwing business called Hank's Hatchets, Hank's Hatchets Axe Throwing moved in next door and began throwing axes at our wall. I'm not talking little axes. I'm talking big, heavy, lunk axes causing massive disturbance, massive loud, could not watch TV, could not sleep. My cats were terrorized. The books were falling, were like threatening to fall off the shelf down at Jim's bookstore. And then on the other side, the tenants of my house were complaining as well. They couldn't sleep. They could have no privacy. It was a massive disturbance. Now, this violated about a half a dozen local ordinances. You'd think that this would be a big deal. Call the police, oh no, we can't do anything, we can't enforce it. The city, well, we'll look into it. The city attorney's office got, a, got back a hold of me and said, well, 
we sent the fire marshal in and they talked to him about it and they said they would move the, the targets down the wall further so they wouldn't be um, directly against your wall. And it took them like three weeks to do that. They finally did do it, thankfully, but it took them three weeks to do it. And in the time though, they committed massive repetitive mistake. I mean, by law, they should have shut down their business until they fixed the problem. They disturbed people for a month, a solid month after first opening. And they opened on Black Friday, the day after Thanksgiving. For a solid month, they harassed, they annoyed, they antagonized their neighbors with these noises and disturbance of the peace. By statute, they should have been sanctioned. But because they told the prosecutor's office by way of the fire marshal that they would fix the problem, they weren't prosecuted. They never faced a charge or a penalty. Why? Because they were going to fix the problem and because they were elite members of society, they're business owners. <clears throat> so people who live in <clears throat> low tenancy, pardon me, my, I've got a little bit of a frog in my throat today, but because we're living in a low, low income tenancy area, we're not the people that count. The citizens are the people that count. People who bring money into the community, they're elite members of society. And I, I raised the argument at the time. So what you're saying is because they are not committing a crime, they, they eventually will not be committing a crime. So if I go out and rob a bank and you catch up with me and I'm no longer robbing the bank, it's past tense, and I promise not to do it again, or I'll resolve to, to stop robbing banks in a few weeks, does that suddenly make it okay? Of course not. It's still a crime. These people committed crimes multiple crimes and they were allowed to continually and perpetually continue to commit crimes for weeks almost a full solid month before they f fixed the problem and yet because they're members elite members of society they're not prosecuted the city attorney would not prosecute them and of course the county attorney wouldn't prosecute them because it's not within their realm of jurisdiction it was in the city it was misdemeanors therefore it would be the county attorney's department but the city attorney would not prosecute because they were going to fix the problem. Elite members, appointed officials, elected officials, never get prosecuted by the prosecutors because they are protected, they are sheltered. Prosecutors decide what information to divulge in a prosecution. Again, they get to decide what information not to as well. Brady Law, which is Brady versus Maryland, a U.S. Supreme Court case decided that prosecutors must turn over any evidence which may be proved to be exculpatory or may basically exonerate the individual of the crime. But it left the decision and discretion of what constitutes that to the prosecutor. And I keep saying this, why does there need to be a law for this? This should be common sense. If the, pro the government is trying to prove that a crime was committed, and there is evidence that proves the crime was not committed, shouldn't the government automatically say, okay, there's the proof. It didn't happen. We don't want it. The, the conviction is far more important than the truth. They don't care if it's true. And they will deliberately keep exculpatory information away from criminal defendants because they don't want them to win. They stack the deck against them. I've talked to him blue in the face about this in so many other, so many other podcasts. But the idea is, <clears throat> even with the government pursuing supposedly truth and justice, why is there a need to hide anything? It's supposed to be about punishing the guilty, not about, you know, let's throw bodies in, in, into jail. It's about punishing the guilty. This is what the whole criminal justice system is supposed to be about. People commit crimes against society or against other individuals. They face a consequence for committing that crime. Pretty simple. So if you have evidence that proves they didn't commit the crime, or may go to prove that they didn't commit the crime, shouldn't that be something you want? No, because that's not what the government wants. The government doesn't want to prove people innocent. It wants to prove people guilty. It wants to prosecute, to persecute, to put people in the prison, to fund the prison for profit system, which again, I've talked about ad nauseum in so many other podcasts. If there's a chance someone isn't guilty, why wouldn't the government be interested in proving that as well? The government's job is to protect the citizenship, to protect the citizenry, to protect the people they serve. 
That's the government's purpose, to shelter and to protect. In a democracy, the government's supposed to work for the people, it's supposed to protect the people, it's supposed to protect society. Who is it protecting if it's throwing people in prison who didn't commit crimes? It's not protecting anyone. It's not protecting society. It's not defending any society. It's just throwing people in jail because they can. I talked about it in my previous podcast about grand juries and the, the function that grand juries are supposed to exist to stop this. But Montana has outlawed grand juries. So there are no grand juries in Montana. At the end of the day, it is left to the prosecutor to decide what qualifies as a crime worthy of prosecution. It's a matter how glaringly obvious it is if the individual is not someone they want to protect, it's fair game. They don't have to have a real reason. They just, let's say they did this and we'll run with it. And we don't care if we find evidence later that proves they didn't do it. We're just going to keep running with it. and We're going to keep them in jail under excessively high bails and put pressure on them and terrorize them and threaten them to where innocent people will bend and commit to a crime they didn't commit in order to get out of jail or to get on with their lives. In upstanding jurisdictions, prosecutors just share everything. Anything they get, they turn over to the defense. It doesn't matter whether it's relevant, it doesn't matter whether it's anything. But in Kalispell, they only share what they want to. They don't divulge the history of the law enforcement. Kalispell right now only has one officer on the Brady list. And the Brady list, of course, is in coordination with the Brady versus Maryland, the Brady law issues. Officers, who, officers or officials who have criminal or misconduct history go on a Brady list because when a criminal defendant is being accused of a crime by this individual, that individual's integrity, their, their propensity for telling the truth or being dishonest, is a huge issue. If this person has a history of being caught in a lie or making false reports or overly prosecuting people of a certain color or gender or whatever, those kind of things are important. Those kind of things show up on a Brady list. But if you vex it, you just viciously make sure that no individual ends up on the Brady list, how is that possible? We just had a recent case, and I did a podcast on it last month, we were talk where the undersheriff, Wayne Dubois, fought to keep a deputy off the list. Travis Wint was basically committed insurance fraud. He had a baby. He didn't report the baby in time to, to qualify for the baby to be covered under the terms of the, of the insurance policy and went to the human resources and tried to get them to doctor the date, to backdate it so he could get his baby on the plan so he wouldn't have to wait for the next enrollment period. That's insurance fraud, ladies and gentlemen. Anybody else just suggesting, trying to, is insurance fraud. It's attempted insurance fraud. He never faced any consequences, and he never ended up on the Brady list. Prosecutors are the ones who have the power to prosecute, and they did nothing. They even interviewed, NBC Montana even interviewed the prosecutor, who, who Travis Honor, and said, he actually said, nope, this is, that's insurance fraud, that's what it is. Deputy never faced crime for it. Deputy never ended up on the Brady list. So the city here and, and offering FaceTime saying, yeah, it's a crime. It doesn't matter if you, if you, if you backdate a document, it's a crime. It's, it's in fraud. It's, it's insurance fraud if it's, in, if it's dealing with insurance. And yet the deputy never faced consequences. He never faced any prosecution. If I did it and I got reported, I could guarantee you I'd be prosecuted. 99% of the people out there listening to this podcast would be prosecuted for attempting insurance fraud, especially if it was turned over to the county attorney for review. And yet, Travis Honor, in spite of coming out and declaring, yes, this is actually a crime, no prosecution. Shelter, protect. Elite, officials, everything. They cover up information that does not advance their case. Bottom line, if they have a case they're prosecuting, they don't divulge any information that doesn't advance their cause or their purpose. They don't care if it's right or fair or just. They care about winning. They care about convicting. And in my case, they care about shutting me up. They prosecuted me in 2004 to silence me. In my case, at my trial, they literally threatened my alleged victim on the stand. They literally did. 
they made it, she had changed her story six times by the time trial came. Jury never saw this because the prosecution wouldn't allow it. My defense attorney, who basically was working for the prosecutor's office, wouldn't bring it up. Oh, I don't, his, his big excuse was, I don't want to make her cry on the stand because then we'll be look like we're bullies. If you can prove she's lying, because in, in law, in law, perjury is only required by, by two really simple elements. One, that the statement is untrue, which is proven by the second point, that, it, that two statements made that contradict cannot both be true. In law, it's not necessary to prove which of those statements is not true, only that both could not be true. And when my alleged victim changes her story six different times, all the details contradicting each other, the propensity for dishonesty immediately would have disqualified her as a witness in any other court of law, except when they're trying to prosecute and silence me. But at the trial, the prosecutors decided to make up a seventh version, a version that apparently they decided not to pass by my alleged victim because she had no idea. I guess they just assumed she would go along with it. They knew she was changing her story when the time was appropriate, whenever it was convenient for her, whenever she was questioned. She would just change her story to fix the details. They must have assumed she'd just go along with it like she had every other time. Only when she was on the stand, she was confused. She didn't recognize what they were trying to do, apparently. So they not, the, the, deep, the new detail was they tried to say I patted the couch and asked her to come back over to me after she got up and left, supposedly. So, of course it didn't happen. The whole thing didn't happen, but that didn't happen either. It was a new detail the prosecution made up and did not pass by my alleged victim. So she ended up saying, when they asked her, did I pat the couch? She said no. So he didn't pat the couch, couch and ask you to come lay back down beside him? She said no. They addressed her by name and said, where are you living? And she started to answer, well, I'm living in foster care. And she started to, to, to name the foster care, I guess, because they interrupted her in the middle of the question. They said, well, I'm, I'm staying, look, you're staying there because your, your mom doesn't believe you. Is that right? Well, yeah, again, addressed her by name. You do want to go home, don't you? At that point, she quiet, her eyes teared up, and you could tell she was on the verge of crying. And then we went back to the line of questioning. It was a direct threat that was removed from the transcript. And I had been trying for 18 years, well, 17 years at this point, 17 years to get the minutes of that transcript, that hearing, that trial, and get an independent transcriptionist. They won't let me have them. They find every excuse to not give me the transcripts. The attorney that I had that most recently offered me an explanation, Lane Bennett, tried to tell me that Tom Sapp, the court reporter, has his own language, his own notes and notational style, and, and nobody else can interpret the, the transcripts except Tom Sapp. Tom Sapp is not a linguist, ladies and gentlemen. He did not make up his own language. He did not create his own language and then somehow incorporate it into shorthand. And even if he did, it's illegal because the state requires that the language of the court is English and English shorthand. The reason why is so that other people in the court can read it and interpret it. You can't make up your own language and then enter it into the court record. It's against the law. And yet, that was the excuse given to me for not turning over the records. Every time I've attempted to try to get the records, I'm blocked. Can't get it. I've encouraged other people to try to file for, uh, for freedom of information requests. And so far, no one's been willing to do it. They don't want to get burned or fly under the radar. Remember, I fought 11 years to get a hold of my the, the docket to the case just to prove that Lori Adams, the prosecutor, and I'll talk about that in a little bit, filed everything four days after I was arrested. It took me 11 years to get that, and then it was because the victim advocate was asked by another friend of mine to get it, and then when they found out I got it because I published it online, 
when the authorities found out I had it, they jumped all over her. They, she called up my friend Robin and goes, what did you do? What did you do? I'm in so much trouble right now. Why did you, why did you do that? Why did you? It's illegal to keep a public record from someone, but they panicked because now I had a document that proved that the entire prosecution against me was fabricated from day one. Of course, it's all been ignored, but this is the reaction. This is a reaction for somebody inside the system who made a request through the connected computer system and got the docket, which is a publicly accessible document. Anybody should be able to walk into court and ask for a copy of the docket of any case, so long as the court case is not sealed. My case is not sealed. They don't want me to have it, but they panicked when they found out I got a copy of it. Now imagine how people going in and asking for freedom of information, asking for the minutes to my trial. They know it's doctored. They know they changed the record. They don't want that. They're going to throw a hissy fit and people are afraid of getting targeted for that. But as I've said, even though they threatened her in open court, they changed the transcript. They changed the transcript to read that she had agreed with her, their request and there was no side conversation in the transcript. It didn't exist. They had completely doctored it out. And they, uh, the transcript actually says she confirmed what they were saying. She never did. She didn't understand what they were wanting her to say. They had to threaten her to get her to go along with the rest of the testimony. They threatened their own witness to make sure I was prosecuted. And as I said, they've blocked every effort I've made to try to get the minutes. The jury never heard that my alleged victim had changed her story six times. They never heard that those details were from a seventh new revised version. My defense wouldn't raise them. The prosecutor made the decision not to bring that up. My defense attorney went along with it. The prosecutor decided which of the two jailhouse informants to bring in. The jury never heard there was a second jailhouse informant. The whole idea was that Larry Van Alstyne, who was in jail in my pod, in the same cell area, for a new charge of sexual assault against a minor, went to, just so happened he had, we had the same attorney, Ed Faya. Edward Gutierrez Faya. Spelled F-A-L-L-A if anybody wants to look it up. Went to him and said, I will, you tell me what you want me to say, just whoever you want me to say, I'll say it, I want to get time off my sentence. I was very vocal about being set up, I was very vocal about the issue and circumstances. He knew I was a target, he, he was willing to, to lie about it, and so he, he said he was willing to, to make a statement saying I confessed to a crime which I never confessed to. My attorney arranged for me to go talk to the, process, to, to the police department and make a, a recorded interview. Details were so far off. It was obvious he'd been through my papers. It was obvious he had gone through. There were references to interviews that the transcripts of that were in my uh, personal property. It was obvious he had been through them or had been shown them because he knew details that I had not discussed with anybody because there was no reason to sit down and go over detailed paperwork with anybody in a pod of criminals, of people being accused of, of crimes. But he went, he literally went to our mutual attorney and offered to do anything, and this is what they came up with. He came back to the cell, nobody did anything with the information for a couple of weeks, and we were in the same pod, same area. He was getting nervous, anxious, obviously. At the time I didn't realize why he was nervous and anxious, but he was getting nervous and kind of fidgety. He decided to, con to confide in another inmate, Frank Allen, who was a con man. He was a, con he was a confidence man. He was all about getting everybody's confidence and, and working everybody against each other so he was protected in the middle. Told Frank Allen what he had done, told him that he was worried. Frank Allen went again to our mutual attorney, Ed Faya, and said, I'm willing to back up what Larry said. And so he got taken in, arranged to be taken in for a police interview. Now keep in mind, my attorney told me nothing of this. Nothing of any of this. 
nothing about how these two were conspiring to do this. So Frank's story is just completely different than, than Larry's. Just completely different. Completely, completely different. Just very, just the details are so far off. Then a, couple, a few weeks later, they decided to call them both back in. And now they've had a few weeks to sit together. Frank obviously came back and told Larry what he had done. Larry and Frank sat down, collaborated, and lined up their details so their stories aligned. They went back for second interviews, and the second interviews lined up almost symmetrically, almost perfectly, because they had a chance to share details and, can, and coordinate their stories. But in the consequence, both of their second interviews contradicted both of their first interviews. So again, prosecution wasn't going to reveal this to the court, to the jury. My defense counsel wouldn't reveal this to the, to the jury. And they decided only to bring in Frank Allen. Again, jury was never informed about the second informant, the one who started the whole process. Larry Van Alstein, Larry Van Alstein is still out there. He's a rat, he's a snitch, whatever you want to call him, he's still out there. Frank Allen was dead three weeks after my trial. Frank Allen, the one testifying at my trial, was dead three weeks later. Supposedly from a drug over, for a drug suicide, it, it, the details didn't match. Didn't match at all. In suicides, there's two kinds of suicides. There is the cry for help, and there's the deliberate suicide. The cry for help is somebody who will do make an attempt in a public place, do something in some way, expect people to walk in on him or her so they can be stopped, are the ones who cry and threaten and protest and everything else to try to make sure that they're the ones who will oftentimes write letters to, to blame people, to lash out, make me feel bad, da 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 da. And you have the deliberates. Deliberates don't make any plans to tell anybody what they're doing. They don't want to be caught. They don't, they oftentimes don't leave letters. They don't leave any kind of word why they're doing what they're doing. They just do it because they've made up their mind they're going to do it and they don't want to be stopped. And if you write a letter, there's a chance you're going to get caught writing the letter. There's always that in the back of their mind. The deliberate suicide people are the people who do not want to be caught. The ones who do want to be caught always write letters because they're always trying to get attention. That's the cry for help. They're trying to get attention. So they will write their, their woes and their, their feelings and their, their angst out in letters of confession. Frank Allen's body was found in the front room of his parents' home. Now, mind you, he was released from jail as a reward for being a witness against my case. <laughs> he was released from jail on his own recognizance at, right after he agreed to be a witness in my case. He was rewarded. He was given benefit. And, of course, he thought he was going to get no, no jail time at all because he was in there on a probation violation. He figured if he's cooperating and putting me away, he's going to help the state. He's going to get, he's going to get out of this. Well, even his attorney testified that that's what he wanted, and he wasn't getting it. So, knowing Frank Allen as I did, having lived with the man for months, watching his mannerisms, knowing how he acted, knowing how he behaved, knowing the way he gained confidence by threatening people or leveraging people, I can easily see Frank Allen going to, going to the prosecutor and saying, look, if you don't let me off of this charge, I'm going to tell everybody that I lied, and then Glick is going to go free. Because that's the kind of thing he did all the time in the pot. All the time in the pot. If you don't do this, I'm going to do that. If you don't do this, I'm going to do that. Because that's how he manipulated people. So I can easily see him doing this. The problem is, it was important enough to the powers that be that Frank not be allowed to tell the truth. He was a, he was a loose thing. He was, he was somebody who was easily, could easily undo the prosecution against me. All he had to do was open his mouth. All he had to do was have a reason to open his mouth. Frank Allen's body was found in the front room of his, his parents' home. He was with pills laid out beside him, apparently. He supposedly ingested the pills. No suicide note, no nothing. His parents came in and found him dead in his front room. 
this normally would appear to be a cry for help suicide attempt. Do it, try to commit suicide in any front room where you can be discovered and walked in on at any time. That's a cry for help. Why is there no suicide now? I've tried to obtain autopsy, determine whether or not, I don't, and I can't determine if an autopsy was ever done. If it was, I'm not being given the records. I've made requests, I've asked around. Nobody in Missoula where this happened wants to acknowledge there was an autopsy. It would be interesting to know whether or not he had actually digested those pills. Because if they were in his esophagus, they would have been forced down his throat and had a chance to reach his system, then he was killed by some other means. And no man even made an effort to look. But being dead three weeks after my trial, with being a critical linchpin in my prosecution, very suspicious. But again, this is the kind of circumstance that happens. Prosecutors control who and where. And I don't know the prosecutors were necessarily the ones behind Frank's death. I believe that somebody in the, in the Great Montana Conspiracy was. It's just too coincidental. It's too lined up. The, the circumstances don't meet a normal suicide attempt. They don't meet the, the fact that it was three weeks after, right when he was be at the point where he was trying to leverage the state to, tell, to say that he was going to talk if they didn't give him what he wanted. Yeah, it's, it's way too coincidental to be just a, a random hand, happenstance suicide. It, it is. But as I said, the only reason why he was brought into the case was because they figured he was an easier, easier witness than the other witness who was, already, who was facing an original charge. Mind you, the prosecutor fought for and obtained the right that we couldn't speak about his history, his past, his 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 dishonesty he demonstrated in the past to his to his probation officer, to in other cases cases that have been brought against him, defended against it. Wouldn't allow us to use it. Wouldn't allow us to use those records. His his PSI, uh, his pre sentence investigation on his former prosecutions, anything wouldn't allow us to use anything to deter his character to demonstrate that he had a propensity for dishonesty. So the jury just saw him as this person who was just trying to come forward and do the right thing. Even though, even at the trial, his details were wrong. His trial, the details were wrong. My defense counsel would do nothing to object. Even when I would insist, they, they object, they wouldn't. When they threatened my alleged victim on the stand, I turned to my attorney and said, they just threatened her. Object, they just threatened her. He just looks back and forth like, what do I do? object. He wouldn't do anything. And I've been cautioned by Judge Curtis before the trial even began, because I had a history for speaking up, that if I tried to speak up during the trial, that I would be removed from the courtroom and the trial would proceed without me. I was under essentially a gag order at my own trial. If I tried to stand up and object on my own, I would have been removed from the courtroom and the trial would proceed without me. Her words. So, I had a choice at that point, whether to stand up and object myself, or to sit back and stay there for the rest of the trial. Now keep in mind, I, like anyone else, would have assumed that that would have been preserved on the record. Even if it wasn't objected to, it was, it was just an argument for ineffective assistance of counsel. But somehow, it got the, the transcript got rewritten from the record. The jury never heard any of this. And the prosecution blocked our ability to discuss Frank Allen's history. And of course, my attorneys were part of the same team. They worked with and for the prosecution and the judges. It was all about keeping the judges happy. If the prosecutors were happy, the judge was happy. And if the defense counsel made any attempts at making waves, they made the judge unhappy. <laughs> it was just, everybody's all about defending each other. Ed Fye even defended the, the prosecution team at my trial in the closing arguments. He made very little effort to actually present the case I wanted to present. I wanted to present that I had sued them, here's the date, here's the timeline, here's where it all, how it all happened. I sued them on November 18th, November 20th, they came and took the children. They held them for three weeks before, living, before I almost said her name. I can't say her name, I'm legally bound from saying her name. Um, 
but my my alleged victim <laughs> or they um anyway they all of this it's just he, he sits there does very little to prosper any record this is a vexatious prosecution he brings up maybe two details when I filed the lawsuit and the fact that February 20th months later prosecution was brought against me I think was maybe the two details he brought up in the entire trial about it and he certainly didn't focus on it he didn't do a whole lot to do anything more than just bring it up and then turn around and at the jury he says my somebody's trying to set up my client mind you he done absolutely nothing to set the foundation for this defense but he says somebody's trying to set up my client not these people turn to the prosecutors not these people these are good people he literally said that not these people but someone is trying to set up my client he just made me sound like a wild-eyed conspiracy theorist he didn't even put the details in the record for the jury to hear he just put this wild accusation in front of the jury with absolutely no foundation and then defended the prosecutors not these guys <laughs> by controlling information prosecutors controlled what the jury saw again they also controlled what they did not see which is the most critical point prosecutors have immense power I have always described there being a triumvirate of power in Flathead County. It consists of the chief district court judge, who's currently Bob Allison, the county attorney, who's currently Trevor, Travis Honor, and the court clerk, who's currently Peg Allison. But it all starts with the prosecutor. Prosecutors bring the charges. Judges sign off on them. They keep other judges in, in, within the party line court clerk controls what information is filed oftentimes as in my case actually removes documents from the court case from the file I have a signed letter from her that actually says and it's on my blog look it up look up Peg Allison on my on monspiracy dot <laughs> monspiracy dot wordpress dot com look it up look up Peg Allison look for the signed document and I'll provide a link to my to my uh, blog in, in my post here so you can go there but the idea here is that I have a signed letter from her that says she took four documents from the court file and put them on her desk for six weeks and then turned around and returned them only because I filed for a writ of supervisory control with the state Supreme Court removing a document from the court file is called tampering with official records it's a felony in the state of Montana and she did it with four documents which makes four felonies she did it in the capacity of her official duties which makes it official misconduct an additional felony so four additional compounded felonies eight felonies she confessed to in a signed letter which she personally signed turned over the sheriff's department the sheriff's department would do nothing with it prosecutor's office obviously would do nothing with it shelter to protect it she controls what is and what is not filed what is rejected what whatever she doesn't want it filed it doesn't get filed she controls the information flow in the court. And then, of course, there's the wonderful proof of services against my ex, Mara. When she was served and I filed for default judgment, the three copies of the proof of service vanished from the court file. There was the proof of service filed with the Sheriff's Department. There was the proof of service I sent in myself. And there was the proof of service attached to the back of the motion for, for, for default judgment. Three copies vanished from the court file. When she doesn't want something there, it's not there. But again, all of this starts with prosecutor. They charge defendants. They decide who to charge, who not to charge. They decide on requesting bail. Universal, which is absolutely universal. Everyone gets assigned bail. 99% of the time it's excessive beyond the capacity of the individual to afford. Which is, of course, a violation of the Eighth Amendment, which is a prohibition against cruel and unusual punishment, but also excessive bails. They control the evidence. They control what witnesses are made available. They don't even have to turn over the witnesses for cross-examination, for deposition. 
in Montana, there's no law that requires them, and they, they, they rely on that. They say it's a cooperative effort. If they want to turn over the witness, they can. If they don't, they don't have to. And they can delay a trial by not making a witness available. How can someone possibly know what to defend against if the witness is withheld? It's a violation of Brady law. There could be exculpatory evidence within the witness's statements, within the witness's testimony. It is a, a, a ball of wax of, of exculpatory information when you can cross-examine a witness. They're not required to in Montana. There's no law that requires them to. It's a violation of federal law. It's a violation of the federal standards set down by Brady versus Maryland. And yet, prosecutors control it. Prosecutors get complete control of what evidence gets turned over. They're complete control of what witnesses are turned over. And of course, at the end of the day, they control the plea bargaining. A defense attorney can try to come and pitch it, pitch it but ultimately, before that can ever go to a judge for a signature, the, the, the prosecutor is the one who has to submit it. They're in complete control of it. If they don't get a deal they like, they don't submit it. The defense does not get to submit a plea bargain to the court and have the court rule on it. The prosecutor does. Justice Robert Jackson, who was a former U.S. Attorney General and sat on the U.S. Supreme Court from 1941 to 1954, had a, had a very interesting quote. He said, The prosecutor has more power over life, liberty, and reputation than any person in America. And it's an absolutely true statement. It was true back in the 1950s. It's true now. Prosecutors can literally take any action done by anyone and turn it into a crime. I scratch my head. They accuse me of making an offensive gesture. It's now a crime. I cough. I'm deliberately trying to, to I don't know, harass, annoy, whatever, someone else. It's a crime. They can take, I'm walking across the street at a green light in the crosswalk. I'm not walking fast enough and I'm obstructing traffic. I'm being lewd to walking the way I'm walking in front of traffic. Whatever they want. They can literally make up anything. And without a grand jury to filter it, they can literally make any act. They can take taking a breath a crime if they're so inclined. Because there's nothing stopping them from doing it. They're the linchpin. They're the, they're the, the motivating force. They're the fire that, that everybody else is just carrying. They're the spark. Without the prosecutor, the mass crypt overcriminalization of the American justice system goes away. Prosecutors can literally take any action and make it into a crime. I did a search on Westlaw before I started this podcast, and it maxed out at over 10,000 cases. So I have no idea how many cases, but over 10,000 cases uh, are prosecutorial misconduct. Just cases on prosecutor over ten thousand. It maxed out at ten thousand. Doesn't go above ten thousand. So, it's it's such an unimaginable number. That, and of course, keep in mind, I'm only accessible to the public search side of Westlaw. So, if anybody's out there as an attorney and actually wants to send me correct information, like if you might have more access to a broader range and not be capped at ten thousand, it'd be great to know an actual number. But prosecutors have the ability to literally destroy anyone's life. Yet very rarely do they face consequences for it, even when they're proven wrong, even when it's proven it's vexatious and malicious and deliberately attempt to hurt or cause harm without any belief this person actually did anything wrong. They never face consequences for it. Even when they're found to commit crimes, corrupt officials flock together to cover it up. In my case, as I mentioned, Lori Adams, who was at that time a deputy county attorney doctored a fake case against me. She went in at 4.33 in the morning before the court clerk's office was open, before any judge was seated, before anything anything was going on, because at that time anybody who had a key to the outside of the building could go into the court clerk's office. It wasn't locked. I used to have um, one of the deputy uh, court clerks who used to talk to me, and she explained me the rationality of this. She said, back in the day before we had all had shared community computers and whatnot, prosecutors would stay very late, judges would stay very late, and they would need to come down and review files. So they would come down to the court clerk's office, and the court clerk would just leave the office open so they could come and look at files when they needed to. Well, of course, 
long outdated concept with the introduction of computers and networking and scanning documents and everything else into computer systems, it was still a practice up until a handful of years ago. Now apparently, I'm told, they do lock it now, but they didn't back in 2004. So she'd walk in at 4.33 in the morning, created four fake documents, none of which were signed by a receiving court clerk. The documents that were supposedly signed by the judge were never signed by a judge. It was never a judge's signature on any of it. It was just a stamped name. 4.33 in the morning, issued an opening document and, and information. 4.44 in the morning, stamped the document, stamped a warrant for my arrest. But the warrant was only addressed to officials within the state of Montana. And she knew at that time I was in Washington. She was in Washington on a business trip trying to set up a satellite in my youth recreations program. I was in Goldendale, Washington. So she sent it to the Clickletack County Sheriff's Office, expecting two things, I'm imagining. One, to ruin my reputation with the Clickletack, with the local authorities and undermine my ability to gain financial independence outside of Montana. But also, and most importantly, to make sure I'm informed that if I return to Montana, I will be arrested. To terrorize me and intimidate me to not return to Montana. Because I was pursuing a lawsuit against the city of Kalispell. The problem is Washington acted on this warrant. They acted on this warrant and they arrested me. And they held me. The next one, this happened on a Friday night. February 20th was a Friday night. I stayed the weekend in the jail. Monday morning came and Lori Adams was informed I had been arrested. She obviously had a powwow with powers that be because Tuesday she went in and she filed the document she had sitting on her desk, including the warrant, mind you. Tuesday morning, four days after I was arrested was when the warrant was filed in the court. There was never a warrant in the court when I got arrested. There was no legal warrant to begin with. And then the powers that be got together and they issued a new warrant a week later. That issued to any authority that finds me. So it would justify, and that was signed by Judge Ted Lippis. So that one was signed. So everybody who participated after that point knew I had been arrested on a fake warrant. They had to issue a new warrant because the warrant wasn't real. It wasn't valid. It wasn't justified. There was no legal authority to arrest me under it. Mind you, at that point, I'd been arrested a week. But they had to issue a proper warrant. So they issued a warrant a week after the original warrant, or after my original arrest date. So clearly everybody gathered together and said, oh, this is a terrible thing. We can't admit this is a fake warrant because then he's got you know, false arrest, fraud, the whole, everything blows up. They had to flock together to protect Lori Adams. So she went in, she filed the papers she had. They went to the court. The judge signed a new warrant and issued it for my arrest. A week after a week after I'd actually been arrested. Did she face consequences? Of course not. Of course she didn't face consequences. The court backed her. The, the county attorney's office backed her. Everybody backed her. And they issued a real warrant a week later. I'd already been detained by that point since February 20th. I, think it was, I want to say it was February 27th they issued the new warrant. And now she serves as a municipal city judge, municipal court judge, the city court here in Kalispell. She's a judge. She got elevated. She got rewarded. She got a judgeship out of it. Now keep in mind, while I was being prosecuted, this is the same person who rolled her truck across the lane of traffic while under the influence. She should have had a DUI. She should have gone to jail. Reckless endangerment, reckless driving, DUI. Instead, the only penalty she got was that the prosecutor's office says she cannot prosecute DUIs for one year. As I pointed out many times in my podcast, she doesn't, she didn't prosecute DUIs. Her caseload was sex offenders. She was pursuing, she only prosecuted sex offenders. She didn't prosecute DUIs. So saying she couldn't prosecute DUIs for a year was like saying a foot surgeon can't do brain surgery for a year. The foot surgeon would never be doing brain surgery in the first place, so saying that he can't do brain surgery is no penalty. I'm allergic to raisins. I'm allergic to horseradish. 
It'd be like saying, my penalty is I can't eat horseradish for a year. Well, I'm not going to eat horseradish. I'm allergic to it. So my penalty is I can't eat horseradish for a year. Okay, great. Thanks. Wonderful. It's not a penalty at all. I'm not going to eat horseradish. I'm allergic to it. So it's ridiculous that that's the penalty. This is what I'm talking about. The prosecutor's office is fully aware that an officer of their office, their deputy of their office, committed three felonies. Well, actually, I think the reckless endangerment and the reckless driving are actually misdemeanors. But the DUI, depending upon how many prior DUIs she may have had and skated off because of her immunity, could very well have been a felony. But three compounded misdemeanors would have been a felony. But somehow, she didn't have a consequence. Her consequence was she couldn't do something she already was not doing and would not be doing for the next year. And she got rewarded and got elevated to judgeship. Every time somebody does something in the criminal justice system, in the courts, in wherever, they get defended. Even when, even when it's proven they did wrong. Peg Allison wrote a letter, signed it, said she would, admitted she had documents on her desk for weeks. Eight, eight compounded felonies. Nothing. I, I, it took me almost 12 years to get a hold of the docket that proved that Lori Adams filed these, do these documents fraudulently. That the arrest warrant that I was arrested under wasn't even filed with the court till four days later. Proves it indisputably. It's the court's own record. She got caught. She got caught committing fraud on the court. No consequence. No public censure. All kept silent. All because no one wanted to expose her to criminal prosecution. And even when I posted the actual docket that proved this, it's ignored. And again, I'll post the link to that. In fact, I'll post the link directly to that one. So you can actually see what I'm talking about. The docket exists. It proves beyond a shadow of a doubt the, rest, the warrant for my arrest was not even filed with the court until four days after my arrest. Something in law called the Fruit of the Poisonous Tree Doctrine. It says... If the foundation of a prosecution is proven to be fault, to be poisonous, bad, corrupt, nothing upon which it relies can, can go forward. It has to be dismissed. My prosecution, my initial arrest, was under a false warrant that never saw a judge's signature, was never issued by a judge, was issued by a want to call her rogue, want to say she was acting under orders, whatever you want to say. She did not have a judicial authority to issue a warrant and send it to Washington, but she did. And she had me arrested under it. And then she filed it with the court four days later. And then a real warrant signed by the judge seven days later. Or seven days later. Caught in the act, covered up. And they fought like banshees to make sure I never saw that. And when I did see it, they freaked out. And yet, everyone's ignored it. I've got the proof. It's no question, it's, it's absolute solid proof. If anybody would actually take the time to look at my case, there's no way it would stand up. I would be exonerated. You have to ask, why was it necessary to pursue so many illegal acts to prosecute me if I was guilty? The fact is, I wasn't guilty. They knew I wasn't guilty, but they only cared about stopping my lawsuit. That's all they cared about. They didn't care whether I was innocent or guilty. They didn't want to face consequences for their crimes. Because when police officers are sexually assaulting minors, Police officers are using their position to threaten and intimidate underage girls to have sexual relationships with them. Those are felonies. They're the criminals. Not me. But I'm the one who went to prison. And they're the ones who've been promoted. They've gone on with their lives. No consequence. And in the case of Lori Adams, she can deliberately make up a fake case, file fraudulent documents in the court, send a document off and declare it to be authentic to another law enforcement agency in another state, face no consequence, and only get rewarded this consequence. Prosecutors, regardless of whether they're from a corrupt jurisdiction or not, they hold massive power. That's just indisputable. Often, a county attorney or a district attorney will have dozens, if not hundreds, of deputy attorneys underneath them. They'll have staff, they'll have whatever. 
And these are all people who expand the power and the resources and the number of cases that can be prosecuted. And it's largely unchecked power. They're in control of a massive surge in prison population. They perpetuate a code of silence around police misconduct, really any official misconduct, especially in Montana, but it's been highlighted in the media so recently with police misconduct. Prosecutors can lie, threaten, harass, even terrorize defendants and their families. Anyone else acting this way would be called a predator. Anyone else acting like this would be charged with crimes. And defendants would be the victims. But this practice is both encouraged and rewarded instead. Prosecutors are given promotions. They face no consequences if they, are, if they fail. If they ruin someone's lives, they destroy it, they obliterate it, they face no consequences. They get rewarded for, for their zealousness, for their commitment to their job. Your commitment to your job should be commitment to justice, to truth, to honor and integrity. You're supposed to be protecting the people, not persecuting them. You're only supposed to persecute people who actually commit crimes, and the crimes you can prove without terrorizing, intimidating, and threatening them, without holding them in jail for excessively long periods of time. Remember, I was held in jail for 16 months before I ever saw a trial. 22 months in total in the, in the jail system before I went to prison because I, that's how long it took for my, my, sentence, my trial to be sentenced. 16 months to trial, 22 months before I ever went to the prison system. Spent three years in prison because I would not confess to a crime I did not commit. Even though the, there's vast amounts of evidence out there that prove my innocence that proved the, the prosecutorial misconduct, the vexatiousness, the misconduct, the crimes committed, I'm the one who's still seen as a criminal. Why was it necessary for so many crimes to be committed to get me to this point? And why have not they suffered the consequences for their crimes? Where's justice? Where's truth? Remember, complaints made against prosecutors are silenced. They're held under, they're silenced under a legal non-disclosure agreement. Anyone making a formal complaint is required to sign an NDA. So even if there are official misconduct complaints, most of them get buried under the rug through silence and secrecy. A person can go to a reporter, the reporter can report on it. So long as they haven't filed a complaint with and, and agreed that, that non-disclosure agreement capacity, a reporter could, could actually report on it, no consequence. Assuming, of course, you weren't living under a state-controlled media like we do here in Fayette County. They will, they dare not put anything out against the local authorities. Ironically, prosecutors could also fix the system. They could stop all this. Even the good ones that are supposedly out there doing things by the book, they're not. They're perpetuating the problem. Prosecutors have the power to stop mass incarceration and the mass prosecutions that lead to mass incarcerations. Prosecutors can institute a policy of truth over conviction. Since most judges follow prosecutors' recommendations, they could decide to release people pre-trial. They don't have to hold them 16 months, two years, longer sometimes, before they see a trial. They could decide to not permit pre-trial publicity. They could, no, no talking to the press, no pre-trial publicity and influencing, but no, Flathead County, they rely on their state-run institution, their state-controlled institution, of controlling the media to make sure that their version of events are always the ones that the newspaper runs with. They could rely on actual process rather than coercive techniques. But they don't. Even the ones who are supposedly upstanding and decent and proper still commit the same grievous errors. Regardless of whether the motivation is for pursue their own career, for a prison for profit system promotion, or whether it's just corruption in general protecting one another, the end result is the same. Mass incarceration, mass imprisonment, and mass conviction of people who are not guilty because of the threats, intimidations, and harassments that are allowed by prosecutors. So what's the point here? One of the core issues empowering the Great Montana Conspiracy is the profit raked in from that abuse. Prosecution, prosecutors sorry, are a huge player in this, if not the most essential player in this, because they're the spark from which the fire blazes. Without prosecutors, judges cannot convict and throw people in prison. Bottom line. Without bodies in prison, the state loses billions of dollars in federal grant funds. Without money to fuel the corruption, corrupt officials lose their power. 
Worse, without the whipping stick threat of prosecution, they can't retaliate. Or at least, they lose the power to do it legally. I'm sure everybody out there has heard stories of cops that, that beat people down or throw, you know, flaming Molotov cocktails through windows or put burning crosses on, on front lawns or whatever to terrorize people they don't want. We've all heard stories of this. Honestly, that's what I can say I have not heard of here in Flathead County. I can actually say I've never heard of the police going out because they don't need to. They've got the legal system to do it for them. Take away the legal system, that might change. But for now, as far as I know, we don't have we do have a sheriff's posse that runs around semi-independent of the sheriff's department. Not really sure what they, their function is, other than the fact they get around and drink beer a lot. <laughs> but regardless, we do have a so-called sheriff's posse. So the potential exists, I suppose. But thankfully, I'm reporting I've not witnessed anything like that here. Bottom line is that most people simply do not know what prosecutors do. They don't know how unnecessary the overcriminalization is or the justice system's complicity in it. They're not aware that the tactics they use only build up an illusion of crime rising. They prosecute more people, they convict more people, it makes it look like the rising crime. When in fact, it's just because they're able to get better and better at better at cornering people and forcing people into, into charges and crimes and everything else. The more aggressive they are, the, the, the more people they prosecute, the more it makes it look like crime is on the rise. Because that's where the statistics come from, from prosecutions. You take out the prosecutor, there go your statistics. Or you force a, cr a criminal justice system to actually bear truth over justice. There was a psychology report I read, so I'm just remembering this as I'm talking rather than being my notes. There's a psychology report that was talking about uh, a jurisdiction, small little town, decided they were going to take a stand against false reports, particularly against women coming in and claiming boyfriends or spouses or whoever had committed sexual crimes against them to retaliate against them for misconduct of some other kind. Cheated on them, left them, didn't do the dishes, whatever. So they decided they were going to institute a policy that whenever someone would come in and make a statement of that nature, they would read, they had a little statement they would read out about what a false report was and the criminal consequences if they were found lying. Roughly 80% of people withdrew their claims. Once they were told that what they were doing was a crime and that they themselves could suffer consequences for being found out for reporting, for making up a story, they withdrew their claims. What does that say? That says 80% of the people were making the claims, were making them vexatiously without any real validity. They just wanted to get back at their ex or their spouse or whoever. Or maybe it was unrequited love. Maybe the, the person embarrassed them in the middle of a shopping center. Who knows? The point is, once the police officer started reading this mandatory statement that warned them that making a false report was a crime, and that there were, these were the criminal consequences, should it be found that a report is a false narrative, they were through the statements, they were through the, the, the charges. If there's 80% of false charges out there just based on that assumption, what does that say for our criminal justice system that prosecutes people like this on a regular basis? Aggressively throws them in jail, bends them to their will, Bend them over backwards until they can't, they can't help but break. Not everybody has the ability to stand up on principle. And fates know why I do. I certainly don't have a whole lot of resources behind me. I don't have, you know, army training. I'm not a big buff guy. I'm just a guy who took a stand and said, no, I'm not going to lie. I'm not going to say I committed a crime I didn't commit. And I've held that stance now since 2003. And it's now 2022. It's almost 20 years. And I'm still holding to it. Not everybody has my capacity to stand ground, I guess. And I'm not sure what gives me that capacity. I just, I'm just too stubborn to give up. It's the same reason why I can't kill myself. I think about it. I have thought about it. It's, 
I, I deal with a chronic joint pain disease that overwhelms me with pain on a frequent basis. I deal with the overwhelming limitations, the, the hatred, the bigotry, everything else for something I never did. My entire life has been about suffering. I'm too stubborn to give up. And in this case, I'm just too stubborn to, to be forced to say something I didn't do. And so here I am, a political prisoner in Montana, fighting back in every way I can. Because the general public is not aware that what the prosecution is doing is creating an illusion of crime, and they're just unaware that 90% is a little more than a scripted show to convince the public that a problem exists. But it really doesn't. It's not anywhere close to those levels. They just want to pretend it is so they can scare people into believing they need their protection. They need them because the crime exists and will continue unabated without their help. But it's an illusion. If the crime level isn't really a reflection of what's actually being committed, only what's being prosecuted and successfully beating people down and terrorizing them into taking plea deals and confessing to crimes they didn't commit just to try to get some degree of liberty back, then how can it be said that the crime statistics are even true? They can't be. I've called before for a prosecutorial review. I call for it again. We need an independent agency that looks over these prosecutions and actually checks whether or not they are actually legitimate. We don't have an independent agency that does that. We need one, but we don't have it. Of course, in Flathead County, we cannot even hold prosecutors accountable because no one will run against them. Once they're in office, it is political suicide to stand up to the judges, to stand up to the prosecutors, to stand up to the court clerk, to try to run against them. These people run unopposed. Even if we wanted to hold, you know, Peg Allison accountable, nobody ever runs against her. If we want to hold Bob Allison, her husband, so-called ex-husband, accountable, head judge, can't hold him accountable. Nobody will run against him. Nobody will run against Travis Honor. And honestly, I, I don't really have a whole lot of bad things to say about Travis Honor other than the recent prosecution of, uh, of the murder trial I was talking about, Brad um, Helios and all that stuff that went down last month. But other than that, I, mean, I can't speak of anything really bad about Travis. I don't, I don't know him. I haven't had a whole lot, had any dealings with him. I can't speak ill of him, but he is part of the triumvirate of power in this county. So it makes his position, unfortunately, in an enemy will one that he's part of the problem. And no one will run against him. You can't get anybody in there who will change anything because you automatically cannot run against these people. They are there for life until they choose to leave office because nobody's allowed to run against them. So what do you do? Ladies and gentlemen, as always, if you're watching this on YouTube, once again, please take the time to like and subscribe, share on all of your social media platforms, whether it be Facebook, Instagram, whatever, Twitter, share the link. Get people, talk to your friends and family, get them to watch this. It's important information. It's important for people to know. Whether you agree or you disagree with, the, with my ultimate conclusions, the information is sound. I only present the truth. As I close this video, as I always say, please, be, please, 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 especially in this day of COVID, be safe. And whenever possible, please be free. Thank you.